our colleagues in the dietary supplement industry and in the sort of, we use the term watchdogs, but it's really intended to be a people who, who have um, a, a, a very different but overlapping role in this space, and that's commenting on currents in, dietary su in the dietary supplement space. Uh, this session has been going on for the entire time that we've held this uh, practicum. Uh, the folks who come to talk with us do this uh, because they're good people. We don't tell them what to say. We don't care to tell them what to say. What we're asking them to do is to represent their perspective about dietary supplements, and then to engage in discussion with you. So that's where you come in. There will be plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions of um, uh, our colleagues in three places. Um, we'll have a discussion that will come uh, coincident with presentations from three industry colleagues. Then we'll have uh, discussion following presentations by three watchdog colleagues, and then uh, all six of them will join me at the front here to uh, in, engage in further conversation, which might be between them. It might be you asking a different set of questions now that you see people uh, who have very different points of view. I encourage you to do this. Um, we've uh, left a fair bit of time for you to be able to engage in conversation with uh, these folks, and uh, uh, you won't, you might not get another chance. So uh, you're forewarned. So we're going to start with uh, presentations from three of our industry colleagues. I'll just list them in order. They're, they've flipped from the order in your. Uh, agenda. Duffy Mackay from the Council for Responsible Nutrition will start, and he'll talk for about 15 minutes. Then uh, Laura Harkness from Church and Dwight will talk for 15, and then Merle Zimmerman from the American Herbal Products Association will also talk for 15 minutes, or up to 15 minutes. If they leave you time for individual questions at the end, I, I'll keep them to 15. Um, and, but then you'll have a chance to talk with them uh, for uh, another 15 minutes or so uh, as a group. So may I start now with Duffy Mackay, who represents the Council for Responsible Nutrition, uh, and he'll tell you what role you have in all of this. Thank you, Paul. Thanks a lot. So thank you guys all for your time and attention. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Duffy Mackay. I'm the Senior Vice President for Scientific and Regulatory Affairs at the Council for Responsible Nutrition. My goal here is to give you a 15-minute overview of who CRN is and why we might be important. I'd like to think I have more than 15 minutes of material on the important side, but I'm going to cram it all together. But I, you know, I, I came with somewhat of a cookie-cutter presentation, but as I sat here and listened for the last day and a half, you know, I, can, I could hear in the questions, there's a lot of disconnect between parts of what you guys have heard and sort of looking at the big picture. You know, we've heard the extremes of uh, spiked products and illegal ingredients in products, which is clearly a, a threat to public health. And then on the other side, we have companies making high quality products with lots of science going into it and everything in between. So I'm going to try to connect some of those dots and answer some of the questions. That's why I brought some notes. Um, so essentially CRN is a industry based trade association. So for those who aren't familiar with many industries here in Washington DC, we have a collective voice. So when, when NIH or FDA has questions for the industry, they don't often prefer to go to one company, they go to a collection of companies in a trade association. And our organization's mission is, is here, and it's essentially to enhance an environment so that they can do business. But that, that comes with a great responsibility because if we're in an industry that has illegal actors that are spiking products with ingredients that people don't know that cause liver failure, we have a great responsibility when you have the white hat companies making multivitamins and fish oil and whey protein and these basic 
in products that have been around a long time, we have to put our resources, join forces with other stakeholders and make sure that we maintain consumer trust. So that's really what our mission as an organization is. Just a little bit of nuts and bolts. We have 20 staff here in Washington, D.C. We have about 120 members of our organization. And this includes branded, finished products that you see at the store shelves, but also includes the ingredient suppliers, the global suppliers of vitamin B and C and fish oil. And so, you know, there's a lot of issues that we encounter with a lot of different regulatory agencies. We also have all of our associate members, the law firms, the testing labs, the, the consultants, the research organizations. And I will mention, I'm hearing a lot of sort of skepticism about the industry and some cautionary tales in what we're hearing. And frankly, this is an industry that does a lot of good science and frankly hires a lot of PhD scientists, toxicologists, nutritionists. So, you know, there is potential future careers, especially if we can maintain and grow the trusted and responsible side of this industry. So here's some of our members. You can recognize brands. You know, the, the big ones, Centrum, you know, Flintstone Vitamins, been around a long time. You know, these are, these are tried and true, trusted brands. Uh, we cover every different segment of the market. We're in the grocery store, we're in the pharmacy, there's direct-to-consumer models, as well as companies that sell directly to healthcare providers. So you probably recognize some of these names. And I will mention, we have a lot of pharmaceutical companies in this business applying their quality control principles. We have the likes of Pfizer, we have the likes of Procter & Gamble. So when you think about the dietary supplement industry, do not segregate it because we overlap and we're involved with a lot of different entities that have reputations to protect and brands to protect. So a lot of energy goes into integrity and product quality. So I'd like to put up this slide because we've heard conversations that sort of span this whole spectrum. And, and, and um, I like to, to look at, we have sort of this one side of our consumer that uses these products probably for, for good reasons. You know, fill nutrient gaps, get a little bit of energy, add some fiber to my diet, maybe some CoQ10 because of my heart, there's good evidence there. You know, people who are looking at evidence, looking at integrity, we have products like multis and fish oils. But on the other side of that equation, we have this shadow industry, and we like to call them the bad actors. We have a problem. We have to recognize this problem. The regulatory structure is not a pre-market approval structure. And so there's a lot of responsibility that's laid on the manufacturer and marketer, and there are unscrupulous players taking advantage of this. And we've heard about a lot of them in the uh, space related to the military. This idea that you've got military consumers that want to get bigger, faster, stronger, and they're gullible, and they're going to believe you if you say, take this product, it'll make your muscles grow. And really, we know that the only thing that's going to do that may be a little extra protein or steroids. And all of those products that, doc that were just previously showed to you are illegal today. Illegal by today's standards. The regulation says those products with Osterine, SARMs, they're illegal. FDA says they're illegal. We say they're illegal. In fact, one of our efforts right now is my organization has introduced legislation to make it easier for the DEA to schedule SARMs. We successfully did that with anabolic steroids. We passed the Designer Anabolic Steroid Control Act, and that gave DEA an easier time scheduling these um, um, designer steroids. So we're trying to do the same thing with SARMs. So my CEO has sort of coined this the tale of two industries. We literally have this one side of the industry aware of the regulations, engaged with the agencies, doing good science, and then we have somewhat of a shadow industry. And we are all working towards you know, maintaining the responsible side of this. And what I've observed here is we've heard from all of these different stakeholders that have different perspectives. We've heard from FDA, FTC. We've had questions about who are the third party certifiers. And what I realized is that each one of these stakeholders has a slightly different view of this industry. If you're a regulator and your job is to keep 350 million Americans safe, and you're realizing, I don't even know what's in all these products, that's a hefty load. You're going to be very skeptical as a regulatory agent. But if your industry and your, your perspective is to sell products, 
you're going to feel a lot more confident in the regulatory structure. But then we have people like Paul here at the NIH where they're just objective. They're just here to look at the science. They don't, they're, they're um, as has been put, they're agnostic to regulations and they're agnostic to sales. So our perspectives feed into a lot of the information that you've heard. So our goal is so that the entire industry somewhere in the future is willing and able to to behave responsibly, be compliant with the regulations, ultimately to protect consumers and maintain consumer trust. So we prioritize some of our efforts and we have our top priorities being consumer safety, so that's one area, so the ingredient safety, how it's made, how things come to market. The next one is product integrity, is what is on the label actually inside the bottle. And the third is conveying accurate and meaningful information so that consumers can make informed choices. So not overstating claims, but providing good evidence to consumers, healthcare providers, dietitians. Now what I realized is these are the one and the same priorities of most of the people that you'll hear from today. It's just that their different perspectives allow them to see it slightly different. So while we prioritize consumer safety, product integrity, and accurate information to consumers, we also want to sell products. FDA, same priorities. They want consumers safe, product integrity, conveying accurate claims, but their job is to catch the bad actors. So they just look at it differently. So you'll see on the other column, these are just some of our activities which I'm going to go through that you'll see by design our tactics to fulfill one of these objectives, whether it's safety, product integrity, or getting accurate messages out. The first one is the dietary supplement registry we call the supplement OWL, or the online wellness library. So essentially, this was born out of some legislation that was introduced in 2013 to re-regulate dietary supplements. Now remember, we have not had a change in regulation since 1994. That was the core change to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that regulates supplements. However, we have had additional regulations overlaid on that. So we have the Food Safety Modernization Act, which changed the responsibilities in the supply chain for supplement manufacturers. We had the Designer Anabolic Steroid Control Act. We had the Adverse Event Reporting Law. So even though Deshaies was passed in 1994, we've had a variety of incremental legislative changes that have changed the operating environment for our companies. But in 2013, there was some legislation put forth by a strong critic of the dietary supplement industry. Most of it was terrible, and it had no chance of passing. However, there was one piece in that, in that legislation that as the supplement CEO sat around the table, they said, you know, a product registry kind of makes sense. You know, the fact that we don't have to register our products or ingredients with the agency, FDA being the agency, is inconsistent with what takes place around the globe. It would be only fair to give FDA a direct line of sight into our products and our ingredients, what we're using, how much we're using. So in the event an ingredient like SARM or an Osterine pops up, the instant they decide there's a safety problem, they can connect the dots to every single person and every single product that is selling it. So it makes sense. So we wanted to answer that question. Who are the companies in the industry? What brands are being marketed? What ingredients are in the marketplace? And which products contain which ingredients? This is what we came up. This is what it looks like. You can go online right now and look at the supplement owl. And <clears throat> When we started on this project, we noticed right away, of course, we have the stellar dietary supplement label days put out by the Office of Dietary Supplements. They had been doing it for a good 10 years at that point. And we went to um, the Office of Dietary Supplements. We started a discussion about our needs as an industry and our desires to have a self-regulatory tool. And we quickly learned that the dietary supplement label database had very set goals and objectives. Um, and they were not completely aligned with our, our desires to have a self-regulatory effort. And so therefore the industry, you know, we, we wanted to, to demonstrate self-regulation, but we also wanted this idea that we were providing FDA with information. And that's where we started to have asks, potential asks to the Office of Dietary Supplements that we realized, 
you know, this would be a big change for what you guys are doing. And the, the conclusion was industry needs to go do this itself so it can make it how it wants. Um, but the key is we've, we've got a memorandum, not a written formal, just, just we realize that we need both of these databases to be successful in order to support the different audiences. So the DSLD from Office Dietary Supplements, the research community benefits tremendously from that tool for a variety of reasons and how it's designed. But the self-regulatory functions are really what we built into the OWL. The idea being that if someday, someday we're looking at legislation again, that we will already have a registry in place and say, Congress, we agree to this, and this is how it should work. A variety of other voluntary guidelines and best practices, but I think you can see the most relevant one, this is an old list. We have significant efforts right now related to SARMs. We are trying to pass legislation, so we are paying lobbyists to go on Capitol Hill to try to pass a law to protect consumers from SARMs, because we see that as a direct threat to public health, a direct threat to trust with our consumer. Uh, we have a consumer campaign right now on our website, SARMs Can Harm. It's directed to the athlete. We've developed relationships with a variety of sports organizations like the International Racquet Club and others, where we're trying to educate their members that the same thing that office, the OPS website is doing is to, to, to distinguish legitimate products from illegitimate products. So you can see that fulfills our objective of safety. We heard from Adam yesterday about protein measurements and how the current regulatory standard for protein measurements is to just do a dipstick and look in there and see how much nitrogen's there. And obviously that's a very easy test to fool if you add free amino acids that are rich in nitrogen. So we put together a protein measuring and labeling standard for the industry that very specifically says only measure native proteins. Any free amino acids do not count to the protein content of that product. So you can see how that effort goes towards product integrity. Um, and then you can see best practices for probiotic manufacturing. We have been trying to get FDA to change the, reg the label regulations so that probiotics are not listed in metric units or milligrams. They're actually listed in colony forming units, which is the meaningful measurement that actually gives consumers information that they can align with science to tell them if this product is actually going to do anything for them. So you can see how that effort goes to communicating consumers information they can use to making purchase choices. And so we are constantly active in the environment, identifying problems, and working as, an, um, as a collective to address them. We heard from the Federal Trade Commission yesterday about their efforts to look at unsubstantiated scientific advertising claims. We realized that Federal Trade Commission has limited resources, can't get to everything. Therefore, we set up a program with the Better Business Bureau, National Advertising Division. We give them, we've given them like $6 million in grants so that they can go out and do cases against companies who are uncompliant with their claims. So I'm going to just fast forward one more, Paul. With claims, uh, we, we noticed a pattern where companies would go to great efforts to make sure their, complaints, their claims were compliant and didn't in, uh, make any drug claims. But what was taking place is at the retail level, the sales clerks, the sales representatives were out there extending and saying, oh, yeah, you can use this for, for heart disease and high blood pressure. So we went on a big effort to ed uh, educate third-party retailers about the limitations about what you could say about their pro our products. So uh, I hope to get to the rest of the stuff in my Q&A time. But thank you for listening. Our contact information is here. And Paul is incorrect. You can contact me anytime you want. <laughs> you, today is not the only time you can talk to us. <laughs> So uh, it's now a pleasure to introduce somebody whom I've not uh, had the pleasure of uh, talking to before, except by phone, Laura Harkness, who is from a manufacturing company called Church and Dwight. And I hope that you can educate me, Laura, about uh, what Church and Dwight does in this space. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have to confess, I've been a registered dietitian for 30 years. So my first job was working in a hospital with patients. So I, I uh, for those fellow dietitians in the room, keep up the good fight. 
Um, let me talk a little bit about Church and Dwight because everybody's, you know, people that aren't familiar with the company always go, is that a law firm? <laughs> well, believe it or not, we, we are 172 years old. We were founded in 1846 by Austin Church and John Dwight. And those are the two gentlemen, they were brother-in-laws. They commercialized making baking soda. So we own Arm & Hammer. So I think now you probably know who we are. For most of our history, in fact, that's what we did. We made baking soda, and we still make baking soda. In fact, we make 14 different grades of baking soda, all the way from uh, industrial cleaners to USP grades that are used by hospitals for renal dialysis and IV sodium bicarbonate, so, and everything in between. You might be cleaning your pool with our baking soda. And a little factoid, when the Statue of Liberty turned 100 on July 4th, 1986, 100 tons of Arm & Hammer baking soda were used to clean Lady Liberty. <laughs> so about uh, 20 or 25 years ago, Church and Dwight embarked on an acquisition spree. And so we are now in 15 categories. And I wanted to show you this slide because I want to impress upon everybody the fact that we are the makers of medical devices, over-the-counter drugs. In fact, we own one prescription drug. And so we are very, very um, involved with FDA-regulated products and quite stringent about following regulations and quality controls within our facilities. So as you can see, probably everybody in this room, I would gather, might have one of our products in your pantry. Is there anybody who doesn't have Church and Dwight? So anything Arm & Hammer comes from us. We, we own a number of oral care brands, toothpaste, or gel, mouth rinses, and so forth. Uh, cleaning products like OxyClean and other fabric cares. Um, and then we also own Trojan. So I'm the only dietitian in the world who can say that I run the product development team for condoms. <laughs> we also own a large animal nutrition business. So that's a, a, a B2B business. And we sell animal nutrition products for farms. So for dairy cattle, uh, for beef cattle, swine, and poultry. And um, the, the goal of that team is largely to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are given to animals. So we provide nutritional uh, products for animals as well as probiotics to the farms to try to reduce the use of antibiotics by farmers. So I want to talk a little bit about the fact that we really do follow um, all of the FDA guidance around good manufacturing standards. And what that entails is really from the time a raw, we source a, a raw material, we actually will audit our raw material suppliers, and they have to pass our own internal audit standards. As well as when we receive the raw materials into our facilities, we test them, and we make sure they are free from microbial contaminations, from heavy metals, from all sorts of anything that may be adulterated in that raw material, all the way through the manufacturing process to make sure that the products that go to consumers are safe. We don't release anything out of our facilities that we haven't put through very rigorous testing processes in terms of making sure what our consumers get on the shelf are safe. We also follow all of the FDA regulations in terms of labeling. And as as you well know, we are in the midst of changing our labels. We actually are moving forward with changing to the new supplemental facts panel, so you're going to start seeing those products on the shelf very soon. I think they should start hitting actually this month. Um, FDA is requiring that all nutrition labels get changed over by January 2020. We decided to go ahead and, and move forward with that anyway. And so for those of you that deal with patients, I can say there is going to be confusion on shelf because you're going to see the current labels as well as some new labels rolling through. I've already seen those, particularly on foods. So I think that the healthcare providers in the room, that's going to be really critical for you to help people understand the, the fact that they may have products, same product, two different uh, supplemental facts labels on the back. We also follow all of the FDA um, standards when it comes to making any kind of label claims. And the FDA does require us to produce dossiers for every single product we have on the market. And that's based on 
the full representation of the science. So we have to do a complete literature review and make sure that we've looked at every study that would support or not support the claim we would like to make on that product. It really does take a village to take an idea from a piece of paper all the way to a product that a consumer would purchase in a store and take to their home. And these are just the people within R&D that, that are involved in developing a product. I actually didn't list the people on the business side from the procurement folks, the transportation people, to the operational folks in the factories and to my marketing colleagues. But it really does take a, a number of critical functions, consumer research, clinical science, toxicology, and so forth, to get a product to market. I wanted to highlight um, that we do a, a tremendous amount of testing. So we do a lot of testing and toxicology um, work, and we have a separate independent group who's responsible for that. They report directly into the head of R&D. They don't report to me. So if they find um, that there's a safety or, or a toxicology issue relative to the products that I'm responsible for, I have no, um, uh, I can't weigh in on their decision. They come and tell me what their decision is, whether that product meets our safety standards or not. We do a lot of sensory testing because we actually manufacture gummy dietary supplements and so people are chewing and ingesting our products and we want to make sure they taste the best we can absolutely make them taste. We do a lot of analytical testing. We test incoming raw materials. Once a product is produced, we test it on the factory floor at multiple points during the manufacturing process. And then we test it after it's bottled and it's, it's on the shelf. And we do a series of tests um, post-bottling over several months to make sure that it still meets our standards. Um, FDA also looks at our testing uh, protocols and our stability program, as well as our retail partners. So um, the retail partners, the big ones, if you think of the Walmart, the Costco's, the Targets, the CVS's, they require us to submit all of our analytical testing to them as well. So I, I had a discussion over lunch um, with um, somebody in the room, and they were saying that this discussion came up among their colleagues. Where should you buy things? Well, I can tell you that the the uh, big retailers are adamant about making sure we submit to them both our consumer as well as our stability testing. So how does a, for those of you who haven't done product development, how does it work? Well, believe it or not, um, a lot of ideas are generated. We get, I, we get hundreds and hundreds of ideas um, to get down to one single product. And then we ask the consumer, what would you like this product to be? How should it taste? What are your expectations of it? What should it look like? Um, and from that, we then start to work on developing the product. So we, we have an idea of what the consumer wants. It does, do they want it to be yellow? Do they want it to taste like oranges? Do they want it to have these specific ingredients? And we start to develop the product based on feedback from the consumer. And it's an iterative loop where we will then go back to the consumer and say, is this what you had in mind? Is this what you would like? Um, and at the same time, my business partners are making the business case to make sure that we can, we can market the, the product and make money on it. Um, and then I'm going to show you a little bit, but then we have to figure out how to scale something up. So uh, we make a kitchen size batch of things, but then it has to be scaled up to a factory level scale so we can make mass quantities um, to be able to get it out to the retailers and then to the consumer's home. So this is a little snapshot of what that means. So first we go ahead and in the lab we make a product. And we make a lot of iterations of a product. Um, we probably make two or 3,000 iterations of the product before we actually have something we're happy with. And then it goes to what's called a pilot or test plant, which will make a little larger size batch, because that's where the process engineering team will start to say, OK, so you, product development, you handed me a recipe, but now I have to figure out how to make this on bigger equipment, industrial size equipment. I have to figure out the processing parameters. I have to figure out how to get the, this product into a bottle. So the processing team spends a lot of time in the pilot plant figuring out how to scale up a recipe. 
as I said, we make gummy vitamins, and I, and I wanted to give a little bit of a snapshot of what the gummy vitamins are because um, it's an interesting matrix to put a vitamin in. It's quite different than a capsule or a tablet. A gummy, if for those of you who've made them at home, you know, is really a super saturated sugar solution that's stabilized with some kind of hydrocolloid. And then it's colored and flavored, and it's what's called deposited. And I'm, I'm going to show you that. You can actually look on YouTube to see a video of how uh, gummies are deposited. I, I couldn't find one that looked very good, but you can go on your own. A gummy vitamin is really a gummy that's fortified with active uh, compounds. Easier said than done. So there's a variety of hydrocolloids that go into making a gummy. Um, there, are, there are pectin-based gummies. So the pectin is typically either from citrus or apple. There are gelatin-based gummies. Gelatin is the tried and true gummy matrix. That's how gummies have been made for, for uh, 100 years. And then there's starch-based gummies, um, which are typically corn or potato starch. Swedish fish, if you've ever had those, are starch-based gummies. So if you uh, want to compare and contrast the bite and the taste, those are a starch-based gummy. The solubilization temperature is quite different depending on the kind of, of uh, hydrocolloid that's used, and the setting temperature is quite different. Our gummies are, tend to be gelatin-based, so the cook temperature it can be up to 240 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, so it would be really hard for a microbial agent to survive in that kind of cooking and solubilization temperature, and I was quite startled to hear that um, there was a product on the market that had come out with a, a, a pretty nasty um, bacillus in, because that in a gummy process we just wouldn't see that kind of thing happen. There's a distinctly different bite for a consumer in terms of the kind of hydrocolloid system that's used and how we have to set the hydrocolloid is quite different depending on the matrix we pick. So how do you actually deposit a gummy? Believe it or not, there's these massive, what they look like, cookie sheets that are full of starch. And, and each cookie sheet then has some kind of pattern laid out into it. So if you're making gummy bears, it has a little bear pattern that's stamped into it. And then the, the candy comes down into a depositor and gets deposited into those little starch holes. And that's called a mogul. And the reason for that is because the starch will slowly draw the moisture out of the uh, gummy mixture and let the gummy set up over time. And that's how you make a good gummy. And that whole process of setting the gummy, drying the gummy, is called curing or stoving. And depending on the hydrocolloid system, it can last anywhere from 6 hours to 24 hours. Gummies, typically we like to finish them. I don't know if anybody's ever bought a bottle of gummy candy and you left it in a hot room or you left it in your car and it got all sticky and liquefied and you had to pry the, the little gummy bears apart. It's very susceptible to heat. So we like to finish the gummies with some kind of finished coating because that helps the gummies stay a little more stable and they, they're less sticky over time. So. We might put oil on them or, or put some kind of sour sand on them or enrobe them in some way so that they then are protected from all the melting that happens. And last I want to show you, this is the packaging line. So our package engineers, and this is our real line, believe it or not, one of our factories, our package engineers um, designed this line. This is a new factory to be able to bottle the gummies. It's fully automated with robots. Um, and the, you can see this robot actually will orient the bottles, so the labels are all the same way, so when it gets packed into a case and gets shipped to one of our uh, vendors, or I mean, retailers, excuse me, it's all ready to go. They can just put it on the shelf, and all the labels are facing out, so whoever's buying it can see the label. I think, that's, I think that was my last slide. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention, and... Um, Happy to be here. Thank you, Laura. Uh, now it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Merle Zimmerman, 
from the American Herbal Products Association uh, to tell you what they do and what their role is. So, Merle. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, wonderful to be here today. And uh, we're getting my slides set up. So it uh, might be a great time to take a small stretch. My slides, I have many of them. I can guarantee that every evaluation I've gotten has said I'm incredibly boring, but sometimes make a joke. So uh, hoping not to let you down on this one. Um, so I'm from the American Herbal Products Association. We're focused on products containing uh, plant ingredients. So um, I'll be able to tell you a little bit about our members, what we do, the types of uh, support we have for the regulatory structures for dietary supplements that include this type of ingredient. So um, uh, first, a little bit about us. Uh, the American Herbal Products Association was founded back in uh, 1982. So we're 36 years old. Um, we have around 400 members, uh, looking at both domestic and international companies that grow, process, manufacture, and market herbs and herbal products. Uh, we've got affiliates who are also like related in providing services to the folks that do that, but our core audience uh, that we help are, um, aside from the American consumer, which we're all in service of in industry, uh, are those companies which provide the service to the consumer. So uh, products include dietary supplements and a bunch of other things that are plants or plant-based. Uh, we work in several uh, big areas. Uh, we provide a representation point for industry to reach out to regulators and legislators with uh, information about what's going on in industry, current best practices, supporting uh, folks doing their best for the country. Um, we provide some educational training opportunities to do with uh, good manufacturing practices uh, and FDA inspections, product labeling. Uh, we have guidance documents in related to new dietary ingredients, adverse event reporting, and things like that. Uh, some of the things we do include some communication to members and media to help uh, folks understand uh, potential subtleties in the area we're focused in, because we all have different points of view. And uh, one of the uh, exciting things that we're involved with is we uh, sort of were, I guess, uh, all maybe type A personalities. So we get everyone together who likes doing things, and then we all work together and look at uh, self-regulatory practices to help support um, the wonderful market that we have today. So um, aside from that, we do a bunch of collaboration work with uh, different organizations. Thank you, ODS, for uh, inviting us down here. Uh, we also, you've seen some of these names elsewhere. So continuing onwards here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little overview of some of the stuff we do with self-regulation, with our interactions with regulators, with respect to legislative stuff. But uh, I'd rather give you guys a more interactive presentation. So let me get out from behind the podium and come up into the room, because we're all here in this together. And uh, <clears throat> we can continue through the slides here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Okay, great. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we're working on, which is uh, in the market here. Uh, we have Herbs of Commerce was mentioned uh, yesterday as a source for names to communicate with uh, the general public, but be specific about what products are and what the ingredients are. Um, with respect to guidances, uh, we've uh, looked at a bunch of different areas, including some good stewardship related uh, things, as well as uh, good agriculture and collection practices. Um, different requirements for testing that are needed under the GMP regulations for um, making sure ingredients are what they are and making sure the right amounts are in all the bottles. As well as uh, some of the outreach that we heard about from FTC where we're talking about uh, communicating where the science currently is as far as um, what you could say on a package or in relation in advertising to help make sure the folks in the public understand what we as a whole understand. So um, I'll, uh, there's a bunch of these. They're all listed here. If you're interested in something specific, if you want to give me a shout after the session, um, I'm happy to help you get a look at uh, some extra stuff that's not here. In association with new di dietary ingredients, you heard a large number of products mentioned sold in the United States, um, including, I think, variant weights for the same sort of products, so Centrum probably has like a dozen uh, in different bottle sizes. But uh, we have a new dietary ingredients database where we do some analysis on the new dietary ingredients that FDA has made available to view, provide a place to do some research. Um, we've got 
our botanical safety handbook, which I think may be the most relevant, uh, the most relevant project that I have to share with you guys today. And uh, as a surprise, I've got everyone access to this, so you can start browsing it on your phone if you'd like to pass that around. I'm not going to say what that password is or what the usernames are, but I've written down the uh, way that that works so you can get signed in. If you're a presenter, I'm not sure that you were in the list that I had of everybody, so give me a shot at the break. I'll make sure you're in. So this talks about uh, an academic sort of review. In the first edition, we had 550 herbs and talked about uh, safety concerns. But the more recently released second edition was partially funded by ODS. Many thanks. Um, provide an information on 700 herbs, and it basically provides little reference articles uh, reviewing the current research on each one. And we've been updating that and started posting uh, new revisions on the website, so you can browse the latest of what we've got available. Um, Events-wise, we hold an uh, industry event to get folks together in the same room, look at current events, current supply chain taking place, things like that. We provide a bunch of technical trainings to do identification and help. Uh, one of the things closest to the heart in Napa has been the American small business. So we were founded by a bunch of the starting members were small businesses. We try to keep uh, folks in mind, help people pursue the American dream, go from getting informed to doing great. So we have a bunch of trainings that we continue to provide and reference materials to help people uh, excel. Um, among these, if you want to check this out on your phone, uh, it might not be that exciting unless you like looking at plants. But uh, we've got a, this uh, botanicalauthentication.org is this reference site that's aimed towards experts who are doing identification work with plants. And we bring together a bunch of publicly available or uh, resources we've uh, got permission to make publicly available uh, together with citations and everything so that people can look at um, voucher specimens, organoleptic characteristics, some macroscopy, microscopy uh, properties, all in one place, just like as a thing to do for the general public. So um, op has been committed for a long time to work with regulators on dietary supplement related issues, uh, organics, adverse event reporting, um, NDI guidances, uh, most recently, we've been on this big project to look at trying to uh, find efficiencies in the regulation so we can have uh, the funds that are available go as far as possible to helping the marketplace be excellent. So um, we've also been committed since, uh, I guess, 2010. We set up a site, like uh, Patricia was mentioning, to sort of track these products that are pretending to be dietary supplements but are drug spiked to uh, try to help raise awareness of that. And um, uh, recently with FISMA passing, there are some really cool new controls and places for folks to keep an eye on in a more structured way so the regulators can also follow it. Uh, so we're working on, uh, we've published a set of good agricultural collection practices that we develop in conjunction with industry to help support that um, and uh, have been doing some trainings on that uh, this last month. So, um, I guess we were involved in writing Deshay back in the day, um, but uh, we're kind of, the folks that remain engaged, but maybe we don't talk about ourselves too much, so uh, you don't hear too much. But feel free to give me a shout anytime if you have questions. We also have an educational foundation that's been doing um, these different research projects. Most recently, they uh, just finished up or are finishing this uh, harvest sustainability project on OSHA, which is um, uh, a wild um, <coughs> crop that's um, in the Midwest, I believe. Uh, Dr. Kelly Kincher from the University of Kansas has been able to run it with the aid of uh, our industry folks and supporters. So um, that's been a multi-year field experiment. Uh, it looked at different harvest pressures on the crop in the wild. <coughs> Um, finally, I think we have a few resources for consumers. Uh, while we provide a directory of our members who are all great responsible manufacturers, uh, we also have some other resources like a field guide to supplements, uh, this uh, yearly event 
that gets people outdoors looking at plants, uh, not just cubicles. And then uh, that uh, tracking site that looks at those uh, tainted products that aren't dietary supplements. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now ask the three uh, speakers, Duffy and uh, uh, the others, to come and sit at the front. I'll moderate for 15 or so minutes. We'll go until three, so there's a little more than 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, folks, for being so very cooperative with uh, time management. And um, so you've heard uh, from our industry colleagues, and I want to know if you have any questions for them. Yes, to the right. Hi, my name is Marianne from Wake Forest School of Medicine, and my question is for um, the uh, Council for Responsible Nutrition and American Herbal Products Association. The companies that you partner with or work with, how do they become uh, a member, so to speak, of your association, and is there any sort of like requirements or a background check? On yes. So, uh, with the American Herbal Products Association, we have a long set of requirements that are member responsibilities, including. Uh, I think I didn't mention while I was getting that note running around about the botanical safety handbook. There's a requirement for all APA members to include certain warning label language about drug interactions, possible safety concerns on labels that have those herbs where um, the academic research and peer-reviewed journals has shown a potential uh, hazard. So we at CIRA, and we do have a vetting process where they get a legal review from our, our outside counsel, takes a look at their advertising claims and previous enforcement actions, um, and then um, we have a discussion at the board level. So th there's a, a variety of vetting processes that take place. In addition, we do have a code of ethics and our voluntary guidelines. So before membership, so you, the voluntary guidelines are above and beyond what the regulation requires. So we're asking them, you know, will you, for caffeine's a good example, uh, several times it was said that the way the regulations are, if there's naturally occurring caffeine in a botanical, you can add the botanical but not disclose the, the absolute amount of caffeine that's found. And so we felt like, well, that's not letting a consumer know how much caffeine's in a product. And so we have a voluntary guideline that says, no matter what the source, you will disclose the total amount and put a warning late, blah, blah, blah. So that if a company doesn't want to do that, then we can say, you know, no thanks. This is our membership, so. Yeah, great, thank you. I will say there are antitrust laws that put a limit. You can't just, you know, say, hey, we're the insider club and, and we're not gonna let you be part of it. So we have, there has to be objective reasons not to include them. Somebody had a question towards the back. You, uh, in the. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so back, I think it was in January or February, the cleanlabelproject.org, they published some, um, about 137 top brands off of Amazon. They tested protein powders, um, some of them vegan, some of them obviously from uh, animal sources. So they had some reviews that weren't great for products that I think I was a little surprised. I think you had Garden of Life as one of your companies that you represent. So there was you know, some heavy metal contamination found in some of their powders. As a representative for some of those companies, um, if, if the Clean Label Project or Consumer Labs publishes information that says, your label's misleading, the amounts aren't in there, you have contamination of some kind. What's the process that you guys go through? How, how are you representing that industry to basically get the trust back from the consumers? So a lot of times with an issue like that, the majority of the activity has to take place between the company and the tester. Because what you may not realize, and protein powders may not be a good example, but it's difficult, and we'll hear from Dr. Cooperman later, but it's difficult if you don't know how a product is put together to reverse engineer and test it is also very difficult. So if you don't know what kind of binding agents and, and colorants and things are used to put it together, sometimes you don't know how to prep the sample to assess what level. So the first step is get the labs talking because the manufacturer is going to have a retain, they're going to have their testing data and how, what method they use, and then the the lab that's, that's claiming that it's not compliant has theirs. Um, 
So that's one issue that has to be worked out. Another issue is with heavy metals. So as you know that a lot of the heavy metals in naturally occurring materials are just environmentally present. And so often you want to read between the lines because in California we have something called Proposition 6.5 which sets very strict limits and it's just a disclosure law. It's not related to safety and often these numbers are irrelevant to what FDA is requiring with regard to products. So, so if the company says we tested this product and they don't pass Prop 6.5, well that's somewhat meaningless in a safety standpoint. So there's a lot of nuances to this, but if there's just egregious violations and they don't have what's in the product, we will have a discussion and we're not gonna keep a member like that. That has not happened to date. Uh, in fact, there was a Canadian Dateline story that did a bunch of this gotcha testing and it was a very sophisticated company that had all their analysis and they got in a head to head with the lawyers. And I will say that that did not air and someone at that broadcasting place lost their job because they did not do their due diligence on making sure their lab results were accurate. Other questions? Mary, did you have questions? Um, it's more of a comment. Um, I just, I don't think you, Merle, I don't think you tooted your horn well enough about the Botanical Safety Handbook, which I, I'll be happy to do that for you since I've been involved actively in both the second and now the third edition. This is a really definitive overview of, um, of, of these data sources for adverse event reports, preclinical data, other kinds of toxicologic data will be in. And, and as far as I'm concerned as a clinician and as a researcher, this is the most, um, the best kind of source and material that's all put together. And then the, the group that reviews it has again a wide variety of experts, clinical people, toxicologists, traditional herbalists, as well as um, people with experience in sort of regulatory, et cetera. So you not only get a definitive set of data, you get a multidisciplinary look at it, and then a, a safety at a level is named, but then the reasons why for different things. Um, so I think with this password passing around, everybody should take that and use it because it's a really terrific resource. And even though I'm participating, I, I, I really would, I would kill to get that, uh, that, that, uh, password if I didn't have it already, so. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And if anyone has difficulty using that, please um, catch me after session or during a break. I'll, I'll take a look. Other questions for our panel? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question for APHA and uh, Council for Responsible Nutrition. So if I am a manufacturer and if I don't register with you or I don't take the membership and uh, I directly go for the, uh, the FDA approval or acknowledgement, as, as we say. So how, how, does, how does it make a difference? Uh, so uh, I can speak for APA. What we, one of the things that we provide is a lot of opportunity for uh, mentorship and a lot of opportunity for uh, seeing um, guidances written in industry that are specific to uh, questions and challenges that you might face in your facility uh, on the floor. From FDA, um, we have wonderful regulators working in the government side to make sure that um, our marketplace is safe. But uh, sometimes the learning process from FDA inspectors isn't as comfortable as uh, talking to uh, industry um, colleagues and um, getting a heads up and um, help uh, making sure everything's as perfect as possible. I'll add to that. I think, I think you, it's, it's fair. You need to recognize that all industries do this. So whether you're making trailer hitches, whether you're the dairy farmers of America or the cheese makers of America, there's these trade associations in Washington, D.C. And what happens is the sophisticated companies that have a vision for the future, they realize, well, God, you know, this issue with bioengineered material and labeling of bioengineered material, that could be really costly if that regulation doesn't, doesn't work out well. And so they say, as a single company, are we gonna be able to shape the national regulation on bioengineering? Probably not. But if we get 25 of the biggest companies together and we put our heads together and we go and say, this is what this entire industry needs, then you have a voice in Washington, D.C. And so really, it's the companies that see the value in that. It's not inexpensive to join our association. And what they're, they're doing is they're paying for a membership that gets them, you know, 
guidance documents, that gets them a voice in DC, it gets them education. I mean, we, we will explain upcoming reg regulations to them and then they'll go turn around to their business units and say, hey guys, we gotta deal with this. The law is changing. You know, we've just learned from our trade association that in the next two years, labels are changing. What are we gonna do? And then what happens is they go look at the, the nuances and they'll come back to us and they'll say, did you notice that they're doing this with the regulation? That's not gonna work, you know? It takes this much to change a label and that. And so it's our job then to go communicate back to the regulator. This is gonna be incredibly costly to the industry without improving public health and that's how we work together. And so it's really, it's, it's unfortunately, if you don't join a trade association, you still get the benefit. And that's the tr tr tricky part for us as businesses. Thank you. Other questions? Bill. Can you guys hear me okay? Let me get with level with this thing real quick. All right, so um, Duffy, Merle, Laura, how many companies, um, particularly, I kind of, this question is kind of more towards Duffy and Merle because they represent more companies than, than, than uh, Laura's company, but how many companies actually do clinical or preclinical research in-house? So um, I guess when it comes to the herbal products industry, that might be a, a complicated question because anyone can go outside and <laughs> That's why pick some it, coffee yeah. or look for some chamomile or uh, get some mint and uh, use it in their life. So as far as I've heard, um, many companies have to balance the cost of running different types of studies and trials against um, the entire industry using the results uh, to talk about themselves instead of maybe that particular company when it comes to the commercial space. But I think that's why uh, APA as well as other organizations work hard and have associated projects that support academic research so that these studies can uh, better be done so that we have more information that benefits the community as a whole. Bill, you raise a really interesting question because what a lot of researchers and outside stakeholders don't realize is that the financial model within supplements drives research a lot. We have no intellectual property protection. These are commodities. You can't patent vitamin C. You can't patent echinacea. So we don't have the same incentives as a drug company. So you guys talked about how there's not safety included in these studies. Well, when I run a study at a university on echinacea, I'm not trying to get approval in three years. So no one's, if I was trying to get drug approval, everyone would say, well, if you're gonna spend the money on the study, make sure you collect this, this, and this, because you're working towards a certain goal. In addition, when you're working for one goal, you're using the same material. So if I'm studying a botanical, I'm gonna use a very well-characterized botanical, and I'm gonna use the same one in every study. And what we see in botanical research is, University A does a study in echinacea, then University B does it, and then University C, and lo and behold, they all source their echinacea different. It was all processed different. So you can't use that data and combine it and figure out what's going on with echinacea. So that financial reality and lack of intellectual property protection, when people complain that the data doesn't have good safety markers, that it's, you know, that we're not using the same material every time, it's the nature of the environment. However, when a big company like Church and Dwight is going to go out there and make a strong claim like help you get to sleep at night, they have an obligation to be able to support that claim. The majority of the solid data actually comes from the ingredient suppliers. So the ingredient supplier is selling a unique ingredient with a unique characteristics. It's in their best interest to get some data so when then I go to a manufacturer to sell it, I say, if you use this ingredient, in this amount, these are the types of things you can say about the product. Um, if I could also jump in, when it comes to herbal products specifically, there's often a really massive traditional set of use and exposure to the human um, populations, which um, you might want to have a historian, librarian to do that research, um, rather than the types of studies we do are running today. Yeah, that's all well and good, except that's traditional use, and these are not traditional use products, to be quite honest with you. Oh, the question is specifically about a new My, my question is primarily towards finished formula, finished formed herbal products. 
not a traditional use like a kava preparation from Fiji, but actually okay. a kava dietary supplement that may be marketed, might be ma manufactured by one of your uh, okay. affiliates. Well, as, as far as the folks I've met that are in the industry, um, most of the people, at least, that I've seen in the APA space um, have been looking very closely at traditional uses during the designs of uh, their uh, products for the consumer. So. Yeah, so, I, and I'm not trying to be, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit trying to be a little bit of a devil's advocate yes. because I think that if there was a way for FDA or USDA or someone to, if there were some incentives for companies that actually had, a, say, a multi-ingredient product that was sourced properly or whatever, these proprietary blends that everybody mm -hmm. talks about, if there was a way to show that your proprietary blend, even if you had just gone through the due diligence to do some proper preclinical safety assessments and maybe even some clinical studies, I know it's expensive. Yes. But if you have, if you meet some of those, uh, if you meet some of those, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, 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 well, we have if seen you some of those, if you meet some of those. Um, benchmarks. Yes. Then you that you you get some uh, protection. Yes. If there and was a way to convince well, the regulatory uh, industry, when, that, that'd be something that would be extremely helpful for the consumer. Oh, if I could offer a. So, um, my company doesn't make herbal supplements, but I, so I'll speak about if we have a proprietary claim, we do the clinical research, mm -hmm. and. To put in a little plug, for those of you going to ASN, we have two posters on Monday. Um, <laughs> so, and I can't speak for all the other companies, but I think the member companies that are very responsible and, and um, players probably do the same thing, that they do, the, do their own in-house clinical research. We work with a number of academics and um, contract research organizations to do the research. Yeah. And so that's another, another uh, this is a question for my own edification. Are there any specific contract research organizations that only deal with botanical dietary supplements? There are contract research organizations that specify that work only in our space, but none that I know of that just specifically do botanical supplements. I think the experts are truly at NCCIH. Uh, you know, they're doing the most rigorous, I and mean, you're familiar with their work, um, you know, as far as from start to finish preclinical. But I want to challenge you back on another thing that's really difficult for our industry is that we can't make disease claims. Mm -hmm. I understand. Right? So think about designing a study that shows your product keeps you normal. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'll, so I'll come back at you, Duffy, and I'll say I'm not really concerned about that. I'm concerned about whether or not someone that takes your product is harmed by it. I'm, I'm, I have no problems with products that, if you can't make it, but to me, and I'm kind of gearing more towards these multi-ingredient products. I noticed a couple of the companies that you, you listed will make a lot of pre-workout supplements. And if you look at some of the ingredients of some of those pre-workout supplements, I question the research behind why those combinations were made. Uh, so that's just, that's what I'm looking at. It's more from a safety issue as opposed to an efficacy issue. Let's take a pause. Okay. It's okay, because I'm, I'm just I didn't mean to trying be to argue minute. No, but, uh, I, this is what you want to do. Uh, but let's take a little pause. Uh, we've got a break for about 15 minutes. Our second panel will come up. We'll talk with them, and then we'll talk again with everybody together. So there may be some follow-on questions uh, from the discussion that was started here. Thanks to the panel members.